Ready? Hit it! Hello everyone and welcome to Twice Nightly The Podcast with Maria Lovelady and Michael Allen Bailey, a podcast that aims to bring everything variety out of the wings and into the limelight. So what are we waiting for? Let's raise the curtain and start the show! Coming up on today's show, we talk to Lady Anne Dodd, the wife of one of the greatest comedians of all time, the legendary, iconic Sir Ken Dodd. We talk to Lady Anne about being the wife of Ken Dodd, but not only his wife, his fellow performer, dancer, stagehand, producer. This lady didn't stop, and she's not stopped now as she continues to take his legacy forth into the future. And find out which unlikely co-star gave Lady Anne the shock of her life when it popped up in her bathroom. (laughs) You'll never guess in a million years. Stay tuned to find out what it is. Welcome back, everybody. It's great to have you here with us again. Now, this feels like, you know, when you put something out there into the universe and you manifest it and you envision it and then all of a sudden it happens. This feels like one of those because we have wanted to do this episode since I think the beginning of the podcast, haven't we? Totally. Since the very beginning, Lady Anne Dodd was one of the guests that was on our list. Me and Mike, we have this golden list of people that we want on. Many of them have sadly passed away during the time that we've had this list. (laughs) Podcast's been going that long. Lady Anne has been in the making for so long. We've been in touch with her. She came to see our show twice nightly at the Shakespeare North Theatre. And we met her and she said to us, this show was my life on stage. And we just couldn't have had a higher accolade, could we? And from that moment on, we knew we got her. She was going to come on the podcast. Now, not only did we get to interview Lady Anne, which was a special event in itself, we also got invited to go and see the screening of Lady Anne's brand new documentary, Ken Dodd, The Man I Loved, which was screened in Leeds City of Varieties. Now, I don't know if anyone's ever been there, if anyone's ever seen a show there. It is one of the most incredible venues. We discovered it recently when we did our theatre tour of Irish Annie's. And it has to be one of the last surviving true music hall venues in the country. And it's still perfectly intact. It's exactly how it would have been back in the old music hall days. You can fully imagine Mary Lloyd standing up there on stage and belting out a good old number. It's so special, that venue. And something that a lot of people know about this venue is that it was used for the good old days. For years and years, this was the venue that was used for the television program. But what many people don't know is that it was the first time that Sir Ken Dodd appeared on television in 1955. And you can just understand when you go, anyone that's been to Leeds, performed at Leeds, it's such a tiny theatre and you can completely understand why Ken shone there because he loved that invisible thread between himself and the audience. And the way that that theatre sort of hugs you when you're stood on stage or when you're an audience member, you can completely see why he thrived in that space. Oh, that was lovely. The way the theatre hugs you. Don't you feel that sometimes when you're on stage? Oh, that needs to be slogan. Like, that needs to be framed (laughs) in the theatre itself. That's great. Why aren't you doing the theatre's PR? If you're listening, everyone, we're here. (laughs) And this documentary was wonderful to watch and we would recommend it to anybody it's doing a tour which has been lovingly dubbed the giggle map tour and it's going all over the country so if you listen to this interview and you think i want to watch that then get yourself along some of the theaters that it's going to are the grand theater in blackpool the floral pavilion in new brighton the plaza in stockport buxton opera house the victoria theater in halifax the royal court theater in liverpool it's going all over the place also mike how many what times have we performed in those theatres, actually? I've just listed off I quite know. a few I was doing theaters. like a little mental checklist in my head. <laughs> How fabulous is that? But I would recommend anyone gets along to any of those venues and goes and sees this documentary because I wish, if there was one thing that I wish I could pass on to all of the listeners, it's I wish I could share the experience of what the screening was like for us because it was so special. Everybody there was so enthusiastic, so passionate about the film and about Sir Ken. We had jam butties. We had cupcakes. We each got given tickling sticks. I mean, it was true 
variety magic. And I think for anyone who thinks, oh, Ken Dodd, I've seen this about him before, I've seen that about him before. I think what you've never seen is from Lady Anne's perspective. She was someone that was obviously a real insider. I mean, she lived with him. You couldn't get any more uh, close than that. (laughs) This is a really unique perspective that you won't get from any other TV show that's been made about Ken Dodd in the past. And what I really took from this was how someone else's legacy, you know, there's no doubt that Ken has left an endless legacy that will probably never be matched on comedy in this country. And what Lady Anne's had to do, it's sort of just been given to her this huge task of continuing that. And what do you do with all that energy that's been created? It it doesn't just dissipate. She's had to take that energy and plow on with it. And I think that the things that she's doing, which she talks about in the interview, is so admirable. And it really is that saying that behind every great man is a great woman. Well, it's a vocation in the truest sense of the word, isn't it? Because you could never plan for something like this. You could never plan to take something like this on. And yet here it is. And what, like we say, you know, it couldn't be in better hands. Now, this is where we would normally do a shameless plug. But actually, we're not going to do a specific shameless plug this week. What we're going to do is we're going to mention a forthcoming episode, which is going to be a companion episode to this episode, which is going to be a tribute to Sir Ken given by some of our former guests. Because actually, if you look back into our archives, Ken Dodd is the performer that most of our guests name as their favourite or as somebody that's influenced them. So we've decided to collate all of these sound bites. We've got together all of our favourite guests, including actress Anne Reid, comedian Joe Pasquale and showbiz producer Michael Harrison. Now you might be thinking, Michael Harrison's never been a guest on your podcast before, Michael and Maria, what are you talking about? Well, stay tuned listeners because actually we have got a very, very special episode with Michael Harrison coming up next week. Keep your eyes peeled for that. It is a corker. It's forthcoming. I've never heard you use that word and you just used it in shameless plug and it really made me laugh. Did I say forthcoming? You said in our forthcoming episode. Did I? (laughs) I tell you what, things you say when you're on a roll. (laughs) You've turned old Shakespearean on us, darling. Right, let's give a little bit of context for the listeners. We recorded this wonderful episode at the Ken Dodd Happiness Hall in Naughty Ash. Sorry, I just had to turn my mic down because the ice cream man was outside and I didn't want it to to come across on the microphone. The child at the child catcher. No, literally. Lollipops. Now, the Ken Dodd Happiness Hall is as happy as it sounds. It is Ken Dodd's old primary school. And it was a building that was really important to the community. It was a school. It's where church services were held, Sunday school. And it was being ripped down. It was a derelict building. And the Ken Dodd Charitable Foundation have restored this building And I mean, to say restored, it makes it sound like they made it how it was. They've restored and improved this building. It's stunning. It's a huge space, really modern, but with all the original features. And it truly is a happy space for the whole community of Naughty Ash. Now, let's waste no more time. Let's get right into our interview with the fantastic Lady Anne Dodd. And we start the interview by having a little chat. We started recording halfway through a little chat where we told Lady Anne that we have a very, very personal connection with Sir Ken because we used to be dancers in his happiness show. So we danced with Sir Ken many a time over the years. Maria was in a... Lovely feather girl dress. Oh, well, I've yeah, seen we've... you. I love seeing you. <laughs> yeah. seen us. We did the Philharmonic a few times, didn't we? We yeah. did New Brighton, Flora Pavilion. Yeah. That was a good connection. Nice, nice connection. Really yes. <laughs> and we, we adored it. It was such... I mean, today we're going to be talking about Ken and his legacy. For us, I think, as young performers, yeah. that was a, a credit on our CV. Oh, yeah. Our be- first credit. Before we graduated. Oh, really? So That's we were lovely. able to leave the industry having already worked professionally. Yes. And with a legend. Yeah. And mm-hmm. he gave that to us. That's lovely. Yeah. That's lovely to hear. And it. still it's in my bio, even after all Mine the too. other things I've Mine done. Too. It's the thing that everyone goes, 
oh, you worked with Ken Dodd. <laughs> oh, you know? oh, that's lovely. That's lovely. that's lovely. That's lovely. Yeah. Well, he enjoyed he, he enjoyed having the kids there as the Diddy Men, and we used to do different Shana. We d- used to do one about uh, the wartime songs, mm. and you mentioned all the little ones that were dressed yeah. up in costumes, Army, Navy, oh. and Air Force. And then we let's all go to the musical. Da, 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 da. And uh, the Diddy Men routine. So we did do different routines with the kids. He did a pantomime once, which he had a cardboard cutout type coach and cardboard horses and cardboard things. It made a very well good prop with a, on a far, firm base, you know. Oh, he'd try anything. <laughs> <laughs> we even had kids doing impressions. And one did, who's the woman on, on Loose Loose? Loose women, you know, Janet Street, Janet Porter. Street Porter, and this little cow came along, and she goes, oh, so, so, so. <laughs> she was brilliant. She was this big. <laughs> did anyone ever do impressions of him? To him? Yes, yes, we did occasionally. They do that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And did he like it? Yes, it was good. He said, "Thank you very much." <laughs> so we're really thrilled to be here today at the Happiness Hall. Such a, a labour of love for you and. and, and the star of your new documentary, one of the stars of your new documentaries, uh, Ken Dodd, The Man I Loved, which we had the privilege of being invited to see on Sunday at Leeds City of Varieties, which is an incredible venue, isn't it's it? It's beautiful. It really it's beautiful. is one of the greatest yeah. venues. And this feels so strange to us because you've been at the top of our wish list for guests since we started this podcast. So to finally get you Thank here you. and to finally Thank be you. chatting to you is such a privilege and well, such an honour. It's so lovely happy. to be here. It's lovely oh, to be so here. glad. So, let's start with the documentary then. I'm sure over the years you've probably been asked a lot to do documentaries like this, to talk about your life with Ken. Why did you think that now was the right time? Well, before he died, I was in the background, which absolutely suited me, suited him. In fact, when I used to keep out of the way photographs and everything, occasionally I'd say, he might just say, you're coming on this one because it's a photograph just to keep. But he said, no, I'm protecting you because you're there and then you're not accessible. But I was doing the work. I mean, the last 20 years, I did all the bookings at mm-hmm. uh, the theatres, to poke to the theatres because the agents we'd had had passed away mm-hmm. and um, he didn't want to start with somebody new. In actual fact, the documentary was proposed before COVID and the idea oh. was that it'll be a, a documentary about how an exhibition is put together right. and the, the Ken Dodd Happiness Exhibition which actually opened last September and is closing in July this year that that was going to be the story but we'd done about six months work we started that in 2019 mm-hmm. and started filming an archivist coming to the house looking at the stuff I met the people who from the Museum of Liverpool and all of a sudden bang COVID They couldn't let anybody in. We couldn't start filming. They couldn't break down the old exhibition. So we carried on filming them coming in, keeping distances. Then after about six months, we we didn't get the BBC commission because they weren't doing commissions. There wasn't anybody there to do it. So we thought, well, we'll carry on ourselves. So I took it on board, cost-wise, as it were. I said, well, I'll make it. Mm -hmm. I'll be the, the producer so that it can be done. We then filmed different things I was doing with his legacy, and it sort of grew arms and legs because Ken set up his um, foundation quite a few years before he passed away. So he was on the trustees, one of the trustees, so I brought in his nephew. We work well together. It has to be two people deciding on any costs from the charity. But the film was a separate issue, and I paid for that myself from the legacy part that was mine. I couldn't expect the charity to pay for that. So that, that, that grew with these arms and legs and all the different things we were doing with the legacy, like Shakespeare North and um, different hospitals that had asked yeah. for help. That he already was in the habit of helping, mm-hmm. but his way of helping was going there, doing it, drawing attention to what different mm. charities. And people think, oh, well, if he's... A, yeah, that's what I'll help as well, you know. So that's how we came to make a documentary that just grew. And I think what I took most from the documentary... Because we've seen a lot about Ken over the years and he's just so fantastic as a performer. But like what you said was that you were often in the background. And what is clear from the documentary, and you said this yourself, that you've been given this mission that you never really asked for. But when, it, when he passed away and there was the legacy to be thought of, you said, oh, I thought someone else would do it. And it became really clear then that it was going to have to be you. And that, for me, the documentary just showed how strong you are and how inspirational you are, that you sort of took this and flew with it. So how has that been for you, that transition? 
It's very kind of you to put it in those words. I've never thought of it that way. It has just developed. As I'm approached with a new project, they're so wonderful. I mean, half of them aren't in the film. They're all good charities. Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of enjoyment from it, actually, and satisfaction. Take it on this, like, this particular legacy of Sir Ken Dodd. I mean, that's a juggernaut. That's a huge responsibility because he's one of the most, the best renowned comedians in the world, isn't he? So do you ever feel a, a pressure of that responsibility that, you, you're, that you're continuing? No, not at all now. <laughs> not until just then. <laughs> I just take one day at a time. Yeah. Uh, but there are things that come in thinking, and everybody says, I know you're very busy, but could you just... <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think about, you were talking about that this happened during COVID as well. Yeah. So you could have very easily, when COVID hit, gone, do you know what? I'm going to get my pyjamas on and my slippers and that's it now. It stopped, it finished. Yeah. And yet you didn't. You used that time to carry on, keep going. And here we are, 2024, are we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you've, you've achieved so much. It's very kind of you to say all this, but you're right. One of the ones, uh, what we did find, Shakespeare North, for instance, mm. at the beginning of COVID, a chem was approached as I think you might remember from the documentary, and was asked um, if he'd be interested, and if you were able to help financially, we could maybe name a cafe after you, and he said, well, I'd like something a little better than a cafe. <laughs> so when they asked me, it was I'd met, been at that first meeting, and the woman who was actually trying to get together people who would possibly help pay for the extras that had to be paid for, uh, they, they give you this thing, if you, name, if you do this, you could name that, you can do this, you can do that. And I said, oh, well, I picked the performance garden. The amazing thing the builders did there was to carry on working right through COVID. Mm. And they were proud of that. And they just carried on working right the way through. Never had a big COVID, you know, outbreak. And what an incredible space. You must be so proud it's of it. We been, were lucky enough that we were able to take our show there um, last two years ago. That's where we met two you. Two years ago, that's where we met you. Oh, of course. That's where we met you, yeah. Oh, of the garden. course. And it felt like such a privilege. I mean, our show was all about variety theatre, so to be in the Ken Dodd yeah. Performance Garden, performance where, garden. Yeah, which performance garden. is just built on a foundation, you know, the legacy know. is built on a, a yeah. legacy of real traditional variety yes. isn't it because that's what he was so passionate well, about he was um, that's right he said variety never died mm. variety was a variety of skills and you can get people i mean look at talent. britain's got talent you've got children there learning mm. skills that you would say could go in a variety show yeah there will always be individuals who've got an idea and want to do something and want to entertain that will always go on there will always be people who want to perform for somebody else that be a show off Especially introverted, quiet people, shy people. <laughs> I'm a shy person underneath, but I always wanted to go on stage. I mean, mm. when I saw pantomimes or any shows. Now, my father loved variety. Mm. He was a solicitor, but he loved variety. And he, yeah. he went to all sorts of variety shows, pantomimes. Well, I was always taking to pantomimes and the magic in a theatre. And that's one of the important things, taking children to theatres, to Definitely. see shows, to see shows where our children are performing and where adults are, and the pantomime story. They'll always go on. But it's the involvement. And variety is a variety of skills. He said, you want to see people. They get an act together and they hone it. They try it. They try a bit there. That goes well. This doesn't. And they've been working that act for years. I mean, some amazing jugglers. You think of juggling. It's not just the ball. We had one called Rudy Horn and, he, and Rudy Cardenas. And little, a cup, a saucer, a cup, a saucer, a cup, and about ten cups and saucers thrown up. And a spoon and two lumps of sugar. I mean, you know, <laughs> you tell me. And he's, and, and then that could be on a, a, a monobike, I mean, you know. <laughs> you, you, you try to learn that. But every day when he was at Blackpool Opera House, big theater, biggest theatre in Europe then, 3,000 seats, twice nightly, he would come in in the morning and practice all day. Right. Well, that's what variety is, a variety of skills. It's nothing that dies or comes alive. It is... That's what the word means. Absolutely. Um, and this is music to our ears because we're <laughs> yeah. always, people say to us, you're doing a variety theatre podcast, is it still alive? And I think you have just answered Absolutely. the question. It will never die. And I think what came across about Sir Ken in the documentary was what a historian he was for um, all of this, visiting yes. the library, yeah. studying it, the yeah. books, and an advocate for the education. You mentioned that yeah. you hadn't gone to university yeah. and I don't think yeah. Sir Ken went to university no. either. No. But I think both of you have Uni studied more than someone university. would have gone. Yeah, University so, of yeah. Life. Have yes. you done that yourselves? Yes. Yeah. Have you been to university? Yes. I, I did a sixth form course at Manchester yes. High School. 
for um, Secretarial and Languages. A lot of the people there were going to big universities and mainly Oxbridge, and I, I definitely felt inferior. Mm. And you shouldn't feel that. You should never yeah. feel that. Um, but Ken just had to break out and do something. And it, it's the University of Life, isn't it? And, and I think it's well, people well like studied. Ken. But I keep calling him Ken like he's my best friend. I apologise. <laughs> it is. So Ken, so Ken, I should say. When, when he said, so something we wanted to really talk to you about was when he saved the Royal Court Theatre. Mm, yeah. And what really hit, hit me in the documentary was when he was saying about the politicians weren't saving the theatres. And he said, I'm just a comedian from Naughty Ash. And he saved it. And I think when you just said you should never feel inferior, it's people like Sir Ken who, who inspire you because he did work hard, yeah. honed his mm. skills and yeah, proved absolutely. that anyone from anywhere can be yes. anything. Yeah, you can. As he said when he used to talk to children in sort of a bit of a lecture, he said once, do you want to be a comedian? Well, say it. I want to be a comedian. I am. I'm going to be a comedian. Right, there you are. That's it. Now get on with it. If you really want to do something, you have to have a go. And he loved meeting young comedians would come to the stage door um, or ask to meet him and, or come and do a little interview. And he never said no, and he enjoyed it. We interviewed um, Joe Pasquale last year, didn't we? And he said that when he did... Was it Opportunity Knox? No, it was, it, was new, it, was new, new it was the one there, the wonderful uh, Yorkshire comedian. Uh, Marty Kane. Marty Kane. Marty Kane. Her programme. I don't um, know that was, yes. And Joe said that he was... Really young, brand new comedian, and he said that Ken came to him in the dressing room, yep. gave him a few little pointers what to do, and he said, and the act soared. Yeah, what he did, he, I, I was there that day, and Joe was his usual self with props everywhere, all over the <laughs> stage, a terrible mess, and he came on and did this, and Ken was one of the judges, and in the interval, uh, well, it wasn't the interval, in the, that was a rehearsal, he saw these things, and he knocked on the door and said, Duh, can I just... Just say one or two things. He said, oh, please, Mr. Oh, please. <laughs> and he said, well, when you do that, why don't you? And do that and follow that. With... And I thought, oh, my gosh, you're telling him too many things. But he did everything he suggested. And it was just like somebody editing his yeah. act. Yeah. And it was wonderful. And I, I know he credits him with that. And that's what he loved, you see, somebody daring to do what he was doing. He was just doing his thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what Joe does. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you said earlier on that you are very much in the background and that you're happy to be in the background, but we know that you had, I mean, you're an array of talents yourself, Lady Anne. You were a dancer, you were a singer, you were a musician. When you started your career and when you started performing on stage, where did you have the vision that it would go? No, I, I loved it. Like, you went to dance school. Yeah. On my day, uh, I was, when, when I was at school, so I used to go all day Saturday and on Monday night to a school in Manchester, from Sophia Tweedy School on Dean's Gate. It just happened that when I was at the high school doing the last sixth form thing, I was still going to dance things. And then I started work at Manchester Airport, which is where I lived. So the Bluebells were on this big theatre show at Manchester Opera House. And I'd read that somebody had gone down to the theatre and asked, could they have an audition? And so I went to the theatre after dance school, my little bag, my little bits, tights and shoes and everything there, <laughs> my little white leotard and pink belt. And, and I went in, could I have an audition? And she was there, she was there putting this new show on, you see, this was the previous year to me joining. And um, I, I asked her and she said, well, to one of the girls, and she said, get her in some fishnets, high heels and do her hair up. And this girl who did that is still a friend of mine now. And she... I came tottering and thought, I'd never danced in heels. <laughs> and she said, I want you to do a few shenies. So I went round the back of Opera House stage on a carpet, kicking up and doing a thing. Oh my God. And on she said, like, would, you, would you like to work at Start in Paris next week? I went, oh, I've only just started working at the airport for 18 months. I've been a secretary. And she said, what will your parents say? Because I was only 18 and a half then. And um, she came to meet my parents, saying she'd be perfectly safe. Da, 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 da. And I went to Paris, uh, saw the show there, the Lido, which is the most amazing show, and all these dancers. But they were all, the minimum was 5'8", five, 5'10", five, high heels, headdresses. It frightened me to death. It was too much. And the next morning, stayed in her flat. And she said the next morning, well, right, would you like to start? Um, I need another girl next week, whatever. I said, well, well not really. And I thought, I wonder she didn't. Yeah, I could <laughs> slap my face and shit me out the room. Well, would you, would you like to work in Rome on television for 12 weeks? I said, oh, yeah, that sounds very exciting. Oh, wow. So that was my first contract. Wow. And another girl, and we made friends, and she's a lovely girl, we shared our room. 
but it was very, very hard work because we had to uh, learn the opening routine, which we did every week, but the first week we had to learn and two other routines, the character thing, and then more so you're visiting a country. It was They never had a light entertainment show, and it was just great. I think back of it as great fun, but it was terrifying mm -hmm. because the American choreographer said, oh, no, guys, first step, then the second step, and the third. And when you do them all together, we've forgotten the first because you're not, <laughs> not in the habit of having to learn them so quickly. Yeah. yeah. You know what it's like. So we learned very quickly in those 12 weeks. But I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Yeah. And then I came back to England and then we worked in Scotland a summer season in Glasgow in a a show called the Five Past Eight show at the Alhambra which is no longer there and that's a baptism of fire as well oh that was <laughs> but it was a wonderful show we had you won't know somebody called Jimmy Logan oh yeah, Boswell, yeah great and the lovely Scottish comedian Jack Radcliffe and there were scenes and things and we had lots of numbers and great costumes and it was fabulous and that show without the, those stars came to Black, came to Manchester and Ken was the star so that was when I first met him Yeah, and I was a dancer in the show yeah in the early 60s. <laughs> and do you remember the first conversation you had or the first... Well, I remember the first yeah. time I saw him because he came down and we're all sitting, you know, you sit in the stalls if everybody was rehearsing the show. So you're, you're sitting there watching and he came down. You know, he said, how to climb, how to climb. And he just got running through for the sound check and this sort of thing. And he said, have you ever been... Uh, have you ever been tickled by Willie? Mrs. He's looking at us. And he said, oh, good old Willie. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> that was when I first saw him. Yeah, and at the side of the stage as he passed off, he used to say com com comic words and things. Uh, and I got to know him as friends, and we all... He was a very friendly, kind person, and we were all um, in awe of him. But, um, yeah, there would be lots of little parties and things. It was great fun. And did he always make you laugh, Lady Anne? From, that oh. first, when, from the first oh, yeah. time you saw him on stage, you always... Well, yeah, he funny... made everybody laugh, yeah. I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yeah. it was. Uh, and, you know, now, even then... My godmother said, oh, he's a bit rude. Well, we think what he's doing now, but you never think he was as rude. But you see, he was quite an early one to say, he never said swear words, mm. but he, he always had inferences that it was in your mind. Thing. And, um, but he was very, very fast. Mm. I didn't get half yeah. of it because it was so fast. Yeah. <laughs> and then how long after you met did you, before you were together? Well, I, was, I then, I left, because during that first year, but my father never met him. They missed each other by four Four wow. months, and yet my father used to go to variety shows, and my mother told me years later, well, of course he used to see Ken in the shows. Uh, he just loved variety, uh, and Gilbert and Sullivan, everything like that. Yeah. I just loved theatre, so that's where my love of theatres came from anyway. But then, no, my, he died, and then I didn't want to go away. Imagine refusing a contract to go to Japan, but I did, because I just didn't want to leave home yeah. then. So I went back to work for the airline and became a stewardess for many years, uh, about 12 years or so, when I went into personnel. But we'd kept in touch because I wanted to do an act. And he actually helped me and some other friends when we, we were doing an act. And I did an act with my, the guitar. I taught myself the guitar because I'd learnt piano for years. And you knew music, you know, I could read music. I like that you make that sound really easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just got a Mel Bay chord book and did that. <laughs> and I went to a music chap in Manchester who played at one of the clubs, the, the Cromford Club, I think it was, you know, where they have a trio of piano, bass, drums, and it's sort of quite jazzy and whatever. And um, he did lessons. Then I started playing the clubs, mm. which was for about 10 years in the 60s into the 70s. And I'm not talking about nightclubs, I'm talking about social clubs. Yes, with clubs. clubs. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and, the, and friendly audiences. Yeah. And you were uh, invited to do the bingo, but we'll be tied you. They give you a free ticket, but you can't win. <laughs> I won a line once, three pounds, and ooh, everybody's looking at you like this. <laughs> but yes, it was great fun. And I, I, I enjoyed that. And that's travelling around with my guitar and my thing. But I was also a stewardess and I fitted it in. I just loved it. I can't, couldn't leave the stage altogether. It's really yeah. lovely that you've just said that they were friendly audiences because oh, that was something that, that really stuck out to me in the documentary was hearing Ken say that his relationship with the audience felt like that of a double act. It was, a, you know, it was oh, him yes. and the audience. It, absolutely. And that really paid off, didn't it? Because there was so much affection for him and for you and for everything. You know, there was... Everything that he did and everything that you did together and everything that you're continuing to do, it's all based in this root of, of love and happiness and positivity. Yeah. It's yes. all positive and You're absolutely right. He well he used to say, I can get at you. And he said it in a television interview and in different television things. He said, I can't get through all this metal and all this cameras and things. That's my audience. There. Mm -hmm. And when I'm in a theatre, 
and especially the good old days and the, some of the small ones, but even bigger theatres, yeah. um, he never played arenas. I can't ever yeah. imagine playing mm-hmm. where you, you're watching a screen. You don't yeah. want to watch there or a screen. You're not there. But, he, um, you know, he would play big places. I mean, Black, Black Brew Opera House was 3,000 people. And in the 60s, Black Brew was packed. You mm-hmm. couldn't move on the beaches or anywhere because they hadn't started going on the cheaper holidays where they could get the weather and they were only spending as much as it would cost them to go to Blackpool. Yeah. <laughs> That's why it all changed. Yeah. But in the 60s, he played that every other season in the summer. In 62, 4, 6 and 8, he was at Blackpool and Press. Twice likely 3,000 people. And it's a responsibility because you've got to deliver... And that's why he honed his act very carefully. And he was always writing new things in. As some people say, that's why it got a bit longer because he didn't always remember to drop something. <laughs> but it expanded. But you had to keep your audience. They, there are so many. And you could find if, the, if you didn't, you had a gag or so that didn't go. That's why he used to write his notes. What doesn't go, that does have to go out. You know, but you don't want to leave some of the good ones out. But he was always trying new things. Every day he'd try and fry half a dozen new gags. But in a show like that, the audience is so big and you must always remember to play to the lights that are there, usually on the edge of the circle. And look at, look there, but play to, remember to think that's where... Because these people will think they're being looked at. Yeah. But it's very easy to get a habit and just talk to the front row and you used to say, keep reminding me, he gets to, in chatting there and they're, they're being <laughs> yeah. left out. So you have to look as though you're talking. But he would... Um, and he, he, one of the things I heard him say in a radio interview is he did himself on television, he said, when you see an audience of 3,000 people, and that is the most amazing theatre, it's wonderful, very good sight lines, every seat is like that, between, mm. so you can, everybody it's can see It's a Frank Matcham, isn't it? Very close. I'm not sure if it is, but the, the, the Grand is, the Grand oh, of Blackpool is, but that's, oh, that's right, a gorgeous theatre. Yeah. And he played those in, in uh, from, from the 90s onwards, he was playing there. But the Opera House, this big audience, and you get the laugh. And his was very much an act where there's a laugh, then a laugh, then a laugh, and he used to call it seven titters per minute. And, it, and then the big payoff gag that comes at the end, and they go, oh, oh, and you know the expression, rocking with laughter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They would rock, go back at this, but if you have a big laugh, you go like this. But when you see 3,000 people do that, it was as though they were walking towards you. I know yeah. that sounds ridiculous. Yeah. They seem to suddenly move towards yeah. you. And that's the most amazing experience. Yeah. But you have to keep control. You have to not pause too long, and yet not, you know. It's absolutely a work of art. And I used to go to the back and watch him sometimes, I'd always go to the back of every show to check the sounds, okay? Because if they can't hear you, they can't laugh. And, mm. and sometimes there'd be a speaker not working and I'd go back. This one's not working, whatever. And I'd go to the back. And then I'd find I'd stay there for 20 minutes as long as I wasn't on. <laughs> Nearly missed my own cue box. And then I'd find I'm listening because it's totally different being a part of the audience. Yeah. Completely. And you'd hear the jokes. It's not that I didn't get them before, but I'm not getting the nuances. I'm watching him because his face, even from a distance... You could always tell his face was um, very movable and he did some... I loved his parodies of songs. Mm. You know, the good uh, when he did the... Um, All together in the fork will dance. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and little movements. And those build up... And like an act is built, <laughs> these people we were talking about before, variety acts. That was like a variety act in itself, that number. Because he... He went, oh, so he's standing there, and he'd pull a lip down, and he'd have all these facial expressions. But his very good, well-trained voice, because he, he, he used voice. to go to yeah, lessons, but it breathing, that's the thing he went for, lessons in breathing, singing, and production. It's amazing to me, for instance, in the, in, in the programmes and audience with, how he did the first half an hour, 20 minutes, without a song, and then went into song and didn't even stop to have a sip of anything. Yeah. How can you go from speech yeah. to singing? Yeah. yeah. And when you were stood in the audience, and obviously you were working, it sounds like you didn't stop working for the whole time <laughs> in the theatre. And your, your doc, the documentary is called The Man I Love. So is, was, he, was he still the same man when you were stood in the audience and you were watching him perform like that? Was that your care? To me, he was always the same person, but he is definitely two people. He, he called himself two people. Mm. And in fact, if you ever watched a television programme, which incidentally he hated doing, when he did the first audience with, which was a programme in 94, and then he did another one in 2004, five or whatever, that was at a time all the alternatives were coming in and all the rest of it. 
but it was a great place for him to go in because he held his own, as it were, yeah. and he carried on and built on it. He loved all the new ideas people were coming in with, yeah. and he didn't wasn't going backwards, he was going forwards. He says, you have to reinvent yourself. Yeah. But he would eventually might watch himself. I said, oh, they're repeating that. Are you going to watch it tonight? I mean, he'd see all the rushes and things, as you might call them, and he'd say, crack it, he shouldn't have done that for a start. And ah. he's like a separate person. Yeah. It was a separate person. And I would often say, I wonder why I did that, yeah. He shouldn't have done that, no, he shouldn't. And he actually, at that point, is analysing it as another person. So he, he, was, he called himself two people, but as far as I was concerned, when I went in the dressing room, I didn't think, oh, this is this big story. Yeah. <laughs> he just yeah. kept, you know. If ever you talk to people, will you have found this yourselves? He looked at you. He yes. Look over your shoulder, who's coming up, what am I missing? Absolutely. You know? He did, he was I'm connected not, with you. Yeah, with whoever he was talking to, he was always there. Because he was interested, wasn't he? He Absolutely. was genuinely interested. He was a genuinely he was curious de- person. And he well, was that's what Michael Billington said. That's right. He was curious. Mm. What did you think of Michael Billington? He's oh, amazing. he was fantastic. He's lovely, he was isn't he? Lovely. And he came all the way up to, for that. Uh, and he has seen everyone and everything. Yeah. He yeah. really is well, someone he, he that's is been a, there and done it Well, of course, he's, he's been an arts critic for... For people like Laurence Olivier and all these painters yeah. and all these well, famous he plays. he said that he, it was Olivier and Ken Dodd were the only two theatrical geniuses he'd yeah. ever but, seen. Uh, admired. The, yeah. That's right. Because they're just that extra. Played. I know. I mean, yeah. and I asked permission to put that on one of the things. And he told, he said, he's a, he also had the phrase, the greatest living comedian of our time, mm. which to mm. me is just... Yeah. You, you were just talking about the dressing room and you going back and seeing Ken. Did he have any... Because his energy was unmatchable, actually. And to, to be in that state all the time, did he have any rituals before he went on or afterwards to keep that energy oh, going? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, when he did the big seasons in Blackpool, in those seasons, he used to get driven there and back, pay a regular taxi firm. And uh, he could think on the way and write and read. And that would be the preparation and in fact, one year in 1971, when he played Malvolio at the Playhouse Theatre, Malvolio from Twelfth Night, he had that, do you remember the scene in the film with the book? Yes. The yes. Penguin yes. edition of Twelfth Night. And the woman from Oxford, who was the professor in Britain, and she was so excited when she saw this book because she saw how he analysed the speeches and his thoughts mm-hmm. And it was annotated. I mean, you could hardly read the printed text because he had so many little yeah. writings. Yeah. The play was at the Playhouse in October for a three-week season. And he, on, he, was, he learnt that part in the car, going up and down. So that's preparation for that particular thing. It was very, very thorough. And he absolutely worked perfect. Does Didn't it mess exist, around. The, the whole film? Nobody filmed it. Oh. That is what's so awful. They did a little for, for South Bank show. They, they had an extract there. But other than that, there isn't a film with the whole oh, thing. It was a shame. Because it was, it's a, so it was brilliant. It's it was brilliant. brilliant. It was absolutely amazing. I did go to see it. It was just quite incredible. It, he really worked at it. And got wonderful reviews from the all papers. Which is amazing. Because is. a lot of time when people step out of their comfort zone mm. and do something different, and people who are doing those jobs can be quite snobby about, oh, who is this oh, exactly. untrained person? Coming? Exactly. And to still get those reviews, exactly. it's almost harder for him well, than anyone else to well, get them. Exactly, because when he first met them, he thought, I'm coming in here amongst them. There was no resentment at all. They were very nice, but they were polite and let her back. But once they got there and they realised he wasn't going to mess around with it. And the producer said, I don't want you to get any laughs. Let Shakespeare get the laughs. Mm, I don't yeah. want you to need put yeah. any bits in. No funny little faces and things. It's only a funny character because he's so, he's so pompous. He's so everything yeah. else, Malvolio. He did it to a T. And we dramatically. had great respect for that, though, didn't we? Because oh, even, even the, the picture on the wall that you showed us, where you said the photographer asked him to be serious, the yeah. and he respected it because a lot of oh, yeah. comedians, exactly. you know, the ego would take over. Oh, no. and that, I'm not going to be told no, no, what no. to do. But he really did he respect, respect the idea of what somebody is. If he agreed with it, he just saw yeah. a point to it. Yeah, absolutely. So other rituals. What else did he oh, do well, he, to preserve oh, that energy? Yes. Well, to, to the end, he well, was still performing. I know. Wasn't he right to the you end? You tell me. You tell me, because he had various health problems. I just don't know how he, he did it. <laughs> but um, he used to say, I'd like half an hour on my own before the show, so make sure I don't want to see people butting in and saying hello. Some did. They said, oh, he knows me well, I'll just go and say hello. I said, well, 
he'd see anybody afterwards and whatever. But before a show, I'd lay some of his makeup things out, but he'd fiddle around. We had little rituals. For instance, he'd have his bow tie there, and he'd be looking at it like this. I thought, what's he looking at it for? What's he doing there? Because he's having a little thought, thought process and things. And he always said he prayed before everything. And I yeah. suddenly realised afterwards, perhaps that was when he said his little prayer. Yeah. And he'd have a notebook where he'd written things that this, I must try this out, I must try that out. And he used to write things on his hand. Mm-hmm. How he ever read them, or sometimes it's just there, you know, that if you suddenly have a pause and you want to do that new gag, it will look and just get a word. Mm. But you try to write too much. Uh, <laughs> Ian McKellen said he wrote it all over his shirt. And I dare say, in those days, he used to... Have, well, there's a picture of him with a shirt hanging out, you know, with a collar like that. I mean, it's like, when I first knew him, that's how he came on. Shirt hanging out here, <laughs> collar here, with an elastic <laughs> holding that together, boots that had hold in them, um, a tail coat that was too long at the back, and a jacket here, and a big daisy. You know, crazy. He always looked crazy. And that muted down a bit over the years. That was part of the energy, psyching mm. himself up, the costume and everything. He literally, you do psych yourself up. Mm. Even in these last years, he'd be standing at the side of stage and several stage managers would say to me, I don't believe that. You've just given him his cup of tea, he's having a quicker sip. He's just standing there, quite serious. In the last shows, he used to start with the drum. And then he'd pick that up, I'd do the announcement, uh, and I can nod, because he always opened his own show. You were warm your own show. It's not fair to expect other people to do it. And he go on. And he said, by the time he reaches Mark, he's lost about 30 years. Yeah. Wow, well, yeah. Because yeah. I can't believe it. And that yeah. was said to me so often. In the early years, yes, I mean, he'd be literally <laughs> raring to go. <laughs> and how about you? Because obviously you were keeping the whole thing together, the nuts and bolts of the operation. What were your rituals? What was your track before a show <laughs> to make it happen while he was having his well, quiet time? I imagine that wasn't quiet for you. Well, in actual fact, <laughs> We get to a theatre, sometimes not with a half an hour to spare. Sometimes you've been held up in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd rush in and he'd always stop to talk. If there was somebody at the stage who always waited, I was to say hello, he'd say hello. I said, can you go to go and do it? He said, mine, keep up. Well, you know, and, I'm, and he was not being rude to me. Yeah, He's doing it to show them that he finds them more important than me telling him he's got to get on with the show. Yeah. And I said, hey, for goodness sake, Ken, we're going to be late. Let's get in. And he's got to do a quick sound check for him and get ready. So if we're in nice time, he'd get in time to have the sound check and then do hard, half an hour on his own. And I had all the various rituals, make sure I've got the props ready. It, it was just great. It was great fun. If it was a season, all those things would be in place. And then, yeah. um, as somebody once said, gosh, you've always arrived for the half, don't you? Which is 35 minutes before the yeah. show starts. Yeah. You'd be there for the half minute. <laughs> <laughs> You're there for the half. Lydia, something I'd, I'd really like to know, changing the tone slightly is, Sir Ken isn't here anymore and you will miss him more than anybody else. The fact that you are surrounded by his memory, his name, his legacy all the time and it's so intense, does that ever become difficult? Does that ever intensify the loss and how much you miss him? That's interesting. Well, I still live in the house we shared for 40 years. Mm-hmm. And at times people say, oh, you're still living there, don't you want to move somewhere? And I said, why? <laughs> yeah. And for a start, and you saw in the documentary about the attics, like, well, a lot of the house is like that. <laughs> There's so much stuff there because we were both hoarders. I've not even done his costumes and things. I've got so many of his stage costumes there and, his, and things. Well, it's a, it's a big task to undertake, it is. isn't it? It's, it is. And, and you and, made a lot of them as well. And well, no, I only made the, the, some of his jokey ones, like the big red coat I made and yeah, everything. Yeah, the monkey coat. Only. Yeah. I only made well, yeah, them. Yeah, <laughs> So it's not, they're not just his costumes, you, you, they're yours I as well. I helped the things. Well, I helped I help do some things together, but... Well, when he died, of course, it, like, when everybody loses someone you're very close to and you've lived with and worked with, it, it's all there all the time. And his, his last show he did on December the 28th in Liverpool, and he passed away on March the 11th. You know, he, he, he wasn't too well at the time. And he got a viral infection, which just didn't clear up, really. Mm. I think making the documentary and all the things I've done, and because it's so involved... It's been cathartic and it's as though he's almost here still. Yeah. Mm. But of course, going around Liverpool is almost like playing Where's Wally, but Where's Ken? Because (laughs) he's he's everywhere. everywhere. And there's pictures of him everywhere. There's busts, there's statues. Have you seen that? There's a wonderful artist. And just before you go to the hotel that's next to the arena, there's a long wall on the edge of a car park. And he has painted all these iconic Liverpool people. Mm. But what's clever, he's only a young man. He's only, I don't know if he's even 20, he might be in the mid-20s. He's got a picture of Arthur Askey, of course, this chap will not remember him. Then Ken, 
than Paul O'Grady. Uh-huh. Now, Ken would refer always in his life to being influenced by Arthur Askey. That's right. Paul O'Grady talks about being influenced by Ken. And he felt Ken created another world. And when I did Lily Savage, I created another world. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, that's what I learned from him. And, and that's true. But to see this, I thought, you're a clever young man. He's got Arthur Askey, Ken, Paul O'Grady. They, they, he linked people. Yeah. How he knew how you needed to do that, I yeah. don't know. Uh, it's a wonderful wall. It's lovely and it's very clever. How does it make you feel that he's still being included in well, all that's, of this? That's, well, that's the purpose to me, to me, uh, because at this very moment we've got these plans to build on to the end of the Royal Court, his favourite mm. theatre, yes. in the 70s. Things were bad, the, the, the country was a mess. We were, we were having a, it was a depression, it was a very difficult decade, um, three-day weeks and the people not got jobs and everything. And the theatre... They said it was going to go. The council said, well, we can't step in. And one of the presidents, he, somebody at the time in the council, he, was, he said, can you'll, can you'll never be able to save it without the benefit of the bottomless public purse and, and there's nothing at the moment around. So he said, oh, I'll put a show on. I'll put a show on. And then he drew attention to the fact we must save this. And he had this marathon earthquake, which is just an idea. Get people, if you want to put some money in to try and save the theatre, but what'll save it is your people making a campaign. We want to save this put it on, what you're going to do. Why was that so important to him to save, save the theatre? Well, because he had done several seasons there in the 60s and 70s, and he, he wanted to still work there. Everybody wanted It was a lovely, lovely theatre. Now it's being run very, very well as a theatre. So the extension there is going to come up quite a way, and it's a very big thing. And the, the plans for that are actually, at this moment, on the point of being hopefully passed. But we've been working on those plans for the last three years. Yeah. We're calling it the Ken Dodd Happiness Centre. I'd like the word comedy in, because he always wanted a comedy museum. Mm. But the idea is it will be comedy and everything in the top. And it'd be significant throughout the building, but there will be a restaurant and downstairs. There'll be, probably be a shop and things for. But it, the idea is it's a place to go. And the happiness, perhaps a place of comfort for people or people. Mm, yeah. But the idea is it'll be there, attached to this theatre he loved so much. Do you get a thrill, Lady Anne? I mean, we've got the beautiful happiness hall that we're in now. We're talking about the happiness centre. Do you get a thrill thinking about what's going to be the next thing? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you've got the energy. I no, don't, I don't, I'm getting honestly. on a bit now. <laughs> I'm getting on a bit now. There'll always be different groups wanting things and wanting to do more. When, when I think about, and I, it's right in front of me, like this is the Happiness Hall, the Happiness Centre. Why was happiness, and obviously the iconic song, why was the word happiness so important? Because a lot of comedy, people spread joy, they make people laugh, a lot of comedy can be quite cruel, you know, everyone's got their own style. Why was happiness so important for him to spread? Well, he used to talk about the rainbow of laughter. He said it starts at the top. He says with white. You've got the white, the pure joy and laughter of children. And then going down the pink and the rosy and the happy and the comfortable and then the yellow. He always thought yellow and pink were colours. Yellow very much the colour of laughter and happiness, pink and everything. And then you come down to the darker colours and the cynic and cynicism, sarcasm and irony. They might still be funny but they're not happy. Mm. And they're cruel. You get cruel after. And I heard somebody say, it's very easy to make people laugh cruel. At someone's expense. Funny. At someone else's yeah. expense. But laughter that brings joy. And Dara O'Brien said this. He came to see Ken in the show at Leeds City Parties, mm-hmm. of all things. And the manager said, Dara Brown's here, can you have a quick word? And Ken said, yes, of course, came in before the show. They had a bit, they gelled immediately because it's two comedians with good brains. And, and Ken said, well, I don't want to let you go, but now he says, it is a long show. I don't expect you to stay until the end. I quite understand it, but you're very welcome if you do. Let's have a little drink. I'd love to talk more, but I quite understand if you're going. It's, I do a very long show, I know. And he stayed to the end and they came back. I couldn't separate them. They were, it was bang, 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 bang. One of the most amazing things to me is he said, I saw the reason, he said, I like to work and make people laugh. Because you can laugh at someone's expense or laugh at a cruel gag, but you don't feel good about it. But he he liked to spread joy and laughter, and from that came happiness and the well-being. And there are big studies now on happiness, why why it's good for you to be happy to build happiness. And if you can help, it's back to the old rather corny saying, you know, if you can make someone happy, 
today, you've done a good job. Oh. Yeah, you know. It's a great quote. That is. Yeah. Yeah. So thinking back, Lady Anne, to when you said that your father used to take you to a lot of variety shows and theatre when you were a kid, who sticks out in your mind as being a really standout performer that well, you saw? Oh, when you say that. <laughs> I mean, I will have seen Ken in Pantomime. Yeah, yeah. It was Pantomime, Gilbert and Sullivan. He was the one who loved variety shows. I didn't quite understand variety shows then as a child. But Norman Evans, you won't know him, but Roy Barraclough. I do remember people like that as a yeah. child. And when I went to pantomime, I used to come home and I had, there was a bay window in my room with curtains that went across like that. And I remember doing this. I used to remember some of the gags and things. And I got one of my little prams. I put two beer bottles in it and that but the day would come on with these. <laughs> and I'm there reenacting things. I mean, it must have been boring for my parents, but I was sitting as the audience and I'd pull these curtains open and it's terrible. <laughs> but, that's, so, but that was watching people like that and, and learning things. And the song sheets. Yes, I, I remember those particularly. Yeah, I, I do. And then, I, and I started the first first boyfriend I had from school. We went to every single play they did at um, the Library Theatre in Manchester, which used to be under the Central Library. Yeah, uh, that was a very famous repertory theatre there. And I used to go to all sorts of. I love ballet, and mm. um, I used to go to the ballet every time it came up to Manchester. But I'd go up in the gallery, you know. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever been. I mean, he saved the Manchester Palace Theatre. That's, that's the one right, that's he doesn't the, credit him with it, but that was the one. In 1977, he'd had a bereavement that year and he hadn't planned a, a, a winter season because he didn't know what was happening. He suddenly saw that the Manchester Palace was going to close. And this wonderful theatre had done so many uh, pantomime seasons there. And uh, it was before the night, the times of one-nighters, you know. And he uh, said, right, that's got to be saved. Oh, we've got to fight that. And he went to the management. Oh, it's closing, Dodger. Can we can't. Uh, it's the end of the season. It's going to be a hotel or car park. The sale's nearly gone through. No, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. It's beautiful. The seats are still there. Everything's there. Yes, but we can't afford to run it. This is Moss Empire's. And he said, uh, well, I'll put a show in. Oh, he said, you can't. It's empty. You'd... In the end, they said, you can have a four-wall contract. I mean, everything inside the building you pay for. Toilet rows, every member of staff, you pay for everything. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> And he took it on. And he got the previous manager, who we knew, who got the staff in, that he got, got the box office staff, got the thing there, got it all cleaned up. So it, it hadn't been closed for long, so it didn't need too much doing physically. And he put this amazing show on. And then he went around all Manchester on the top of a bus, banging the drum, BBC, ITV, Granada. Everybody, New Manchester Evening News, they all got behind it. And everybody helped sell the pack, this theatre's got to be saved. And he did twice nightly from the day they opened in early December till March when he had to go to Nottingham because they'd refurbished their, play, uh, their theatre and he was going to open their, reopen their theatre. But he saved that theatre because mm. then a trust took it on and then the council took it on and then this. And there was, now they're both still standing. So talking, working off that idea of these, these two theatres, you must have been in thousands of venues and theatres over, over the years. Where would you say stands out as some of your personal favourite venues that you like to go and visit and you, um, or you like to stand backstage well, on? Well, the funny thing is, having made this film, which at the moment isn't due to go on television particularly, it may do in the future, we've got this documentary, it's got to be seen, we've done all this work. So our team, we thought, right, let's, let's take it out on the road, as it were, or send it out. And they said, well, you've got the contacts. For the last 20 years, I did all the contracts with theatres, and he would revisit some of them each year, you know, one-nighters, yeah. two-nighters sometimes, sometimes. So I've contacted some, and at first I thought, this is new, we've not had to do this, I've talked about live shows. Theater. And when they said, oh, a film, oh, lovely idea. So I have booked about 20 of our regular dates, and we're going to take the film there, or send the film there, yeah. And that where I can, unless it's too far, I'm going to go and just do a little, hello, hope you're going to enjoy this. And we'll have a little Q&A afterwards. And if you put a question in at the interval, I'm used to doing talks about what I've been doing at social clubs, church clubs and things. And I enjoy those, but I'm not expecting to do a talk. I'm expecting to introduce it, maybe ask them if they want to ask questions. But it's very embryonic. Mm. I don't know, I must be mad. <laughs> well, we saw you do it, and it was fantastic. Well, that was, and what a great venue to do it at! I mean, Leeds well, that City was there, and of course, there I did a sort of speech trying to encompass various things. That, I was very nervous for that on yeah. Saturday, on oh, on Sunday. Oh, thank you, thank you. It was the whole thing has been cathartic. So being there on that day, 
it was quite emotional, but you, you actually have to ride above it in yourself, otherwise you start being yeah. silly. You know? Did did Sir Ken ever talk about a, a particular venue as a, well as a favourite? He was oh, often was asked, what was your favourite theatre? What is your favourite theatre when you're still working? And he'd say, the one I'm playing tomorrow night. Yes. I love it. Yeah. Which is a lovely tactful thing it to is. say. It and is. it was, yeah. because people would say, will you save our theatre? Will you do this? We've had, I could show you letters of people, will you save our theatre? And he'd say, who wants to save it? Who is there? Have you got a friends group? Have you got this? Uh, well, no, but I wanted to make me make thing. He said, you've got to get people together who want to save it. I mean, mm. Stockport has a wonderful yes. theatre, the yeah, plaza. It does. Absolutely marvellous. Yeah. And he's worked there. We've worked them. We've helped them in the past. And then we've done proper commercial shows. You sell the ticket. But when they first wanted to save it, there were holes in the roof that were coming through from... Because it's built most peculiar. There's a road above on the water. Yeah, the track. Yeah. It's very unusual. You go in <laughs> yeah. and they climb to go in the audience against them. It's quite extraordinary theatre. But it's been beautifully restored a Stunning. bit at a time. A bit at a time. Yeah. And they have a wonderful organ that comes up. That's yeah. right. The organ. And the last few years, whilst they were redoing it in the 20s, every time we went, they'd say, we'd like the organ. Yes, that'd be lovely. So they play when they're coming in. Fellow, and they usually got somebody from Blackpool, one or two famous organists, and they're playing away. And then, as we're ready to start our show, we tell the limes, you know, the lights at the back, to just dim for a moment, do a quick little flash like that. That means we're ready. But occasionally, somebody get carried away, and they don't notice that. <laughs> and at the curtains are here, and he's sitting up there. So I used to put my head under there and say. Fred, can you hurry up? Could we finish on this number, please? <laughs> but the audience can't see me because he's up there. Oh, wonderful. Lovely. And they've got a passerella, we used to call it. You dance out on these passerellas, you know, that come round when there's the orchestra pits in. Yeah. Oh, God, we used to dance on those in high heels and it was glass. <laughs> oh. But they've rebuilt that. And then the, the, they've got a coffee uh, lounge upstairs which is actually gorgeous. It is, it's, so it's, well. been, it's just yeah. lovely. We, play, uh, we performed there about oh, month, six weeks ago. Oh, yeah, not lovely. Not yeah. Yeah. It's lovely. It's a beautiful theatre. Yes. It really is. It really is. Now I want to ask you a question. What do you two do? I mean, when you say we perform there... So we were in Irish Annie's with Ricky. Oh, Thompson. were you? We were. Yeah. Oh, yeah. we were in Irish Annie's. Yeah. And um, oh, Sue right. Johnson came yes. and performed with us at Stockport Plaza. Oh, that's oh, right. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So I would love to know, for those people that are listening, because you really were in the thick of it, in the, the heyday of variety. Yes, yes. What's something about that era that people might not know? Oh, gosh. Because we hear, this, we hear yes. a lot of things yeah. about how it was. I mean, even just you leaning under the curtain and things like that is such an amazing story. But what, what might people not know about that era if they weren't oh, there? Oh, gosh. I mean, there are all the things that can go wrong. You know, you've got people who could never work without mics now. Um, yeah. You know, but in those days, I mean, well, in the very early days, there weren't before microphones. Yeah, yeah. People did have to project, and that's why they would shout and everything. I bet you've you really realize. seen an improvement over the years, Lady Anne, of, of the quality of dressing rooms. Yes, I bet you've seen. Oh so. my goodness! <laughs> oh my goodness! Ken, Ken used to talk about the dressing rooms. Over there. He said, "Well, dressing rooms don't matter. Just make sure the stage is there. They can see and hear you and everything. Dressing rooms all do, but a lot of theatres have done them up. Bridlington <laughs> Theatre." had some rather old dressing rooms. So it's been beautifully done up now, but the last thing that they think about is doing up the dressing rooms. And they made a lovely job there, refurbished the whole lot, and it's very nice. But before they did that, I remember we were doing a season, and it was when Ken's dad was rather poorly. So instead of staying there, we used to go back mm-hmm. once or twice in the week. And we were about to go home, and he said, I think we should go back and check on my dad. I said, OK. He'd come off, go change, do the bits. And then, you know, me, honey, I'm ready to go now. So I was like, Get yourself fresh. Oh, I've got to wash my face. I thought I'll go to the bathroom. Now, the bathroom <laughs> on that floor <laughs> was, was a toilet and then a frosted glass and then a space. And in there was the bath. I needed to go to the toilet, whatever. I'm sitting there <laughs> and then bang, and there's something banged on this wall. And as I looked, there was this leopard. <gasps> oh! <And> it, <laughs> There's a magic act called Johnny Hart, <coughs> and he started with a leopard in a cage. And I can see, I can see him, his body, leg, back legs, front legs, and his claws are at the top. And it's not very far, and his, oh. his back legs are coming up as well. Well, do you know, it is amazing how fast you can run with your moves around the corner. <laughs> Wherever we thought that story was going, Lady Anne, it was never going to be that it was a leopard. <laughs> it was in the, it's, he just left it in the bath area. And it was, a, it was a lovely tame leopard, but not to hurt you. He said, what the hell? 
I said a bloody hard attack. Oh my gosh. And these are the stories I think that are so amazing to keep. Oh, they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The world health has and safety so these much. days. Well, health and safety has protected some accidents, one must admit. <laughs> but you certainly couldn't do now a lot of the things. I'm just trying to think of the th- things that we did, that you did do. It only came across us the other day at the City of Artists. Um, they they refurbished all the halls and everything, and it was only in the last few years they did all the dressing rooms. And there's definitely a ghost there. Ah, I have worked there. A wonderful artist, Joan Hind, was the most wonderful female trumpeter. She was brilliant, brilliant player, and great sense of humour. And we used to kind of to see those two chatting together about the old days of variety and everything was wonderful. They just bounced off each other. And she was very up-to-date in her ways, but she could play this. And she would be our, one of our support acts. Anyway, she was on this show, and we I had a little dressing room up on the top, and she did, and there were three dressing rooms there. And I thought, oh, I've just got to say, oh, Joan, good, she's just gone back in her dressing room, because I swear to God, I heard the door open and closing in there, and then open again. And I thought, oh, I'll nip in just before she comes. Hi, Joan. Nobody else should be there. Joan? And there was nobody. And there was nobody. There was nobody in there. Nobody wow. just got... And I'd heard this story. And anyway, but other people said, oh, that's the ghost. And they've even got a name. But nobody <coughs> mentioned it the other day. But they they do. Whether the ghost, uh, the ghost has gone somewhere else now. <laughs> <laughs> but no, they all talk about the ghost there. There are theatres, theaters, some theatres that say there is a ghost. Yeah. Yeah, I've right. never seen anything, but no. I must admit... That day, oh dear, <laughs> it was a bit strange. Yeah. It was strange. But it, it's wonderful theatre there. And all these little back corridors, but the dangerous steep stairs and everything, which you just managed nowadays. So, and in, you your, in your costumes and here. Ah, exactly. And I know. like that. I know. So how was it then, because we've talked to a lot of people who it seems there were a lot of women running this backstage Nowadays there are there yeah, a lot but, more. Uh, no, but if, and that's, how was it for you then doing this kind of work, running the backstage, and at, at that period of time when it was different for women? Yeah, it was, it was mainly men would do the backstage running, but um, so it didn't make any female. difference to you. Oh, it didn't make any yeah. difference at all. No, but um, in the old days, it might have been a bit more chauvinistic because that was the way things were. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. we've yeah. even when you go back to music hall, you'll find that there's a really great male comedian and then we find out in the research that it was his wife as the manager even mm. yes even then yeah oh yes yeah i think uh, show business has changed a lot over the years yeah well it had to uh, that's the way everything changes well that was a line of the documentary as well wasn't it but behind every great man there's a great woman pushing him forward or <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an exhausted <laughs> <woman as children. laughs> he would, and people came to the stage door bound to tell him their life stories mm. and we, we, we he got to know the names and people yeah. and you know certain um, when when you were doing seasons they would come two or three times in a season so it would be you know there'd be a lot of people who were what we'd call regulars and they mm. were wonderful and they'd they'd make more friends and we got regulars who get friends with each other have you seen <laughs> where are you going your next one you're going to you yeah know? it's like a club it's in lovely. itself it's lovely but again yeah. it goes back to that thing that we've said all along isn't it about that community yes. everything you've done now is for the community oh. even that that you know oh. you built up a, a community in, in there are, what, there are what people he, did. he he was as Michael Billington said he was curious he was curious about everybody he met mm. and he always looked straight up and he never looked over the shoulder is there anyone else I should be talking to and that's why it used to take forever before I could get away. Sometimes when people say I was there till two o'clock, half past two, it's because they waited to see him afterwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I don't think we ever went. I never went that late on stage. <laughs> and he has been as late as nearly one o'clock. Wow. I, have, I have to admit. But um, we used to have contracts that said you could finish at twenty-three fifty-nine, and that was all the Apollo ones. And we generally tried to make it. But this that's a long show, isn't it? Seven p.m. till Absolutely. midnight. Midnight. And, and as his wife, were you not like, oh, come on, let's just get home? Or were you always thinking, no, well, that's I'd, what he wants? No, I, um, I'd start packing. If it, because with the one-nighters, <laughs> you've got to pack up after every show, which suited me fine. And as you're going along, I'm sure you do it yourself. If yeah. you, you move away to things that you can yeah, pack yeah. Uh, and get ready to go. Um, but, I mean, some people go on stage, come off one and go, and that's it. But he never did that. But we used to say, I used to say, Ken, you cannot go down. It's no good just... Mopping your face, putting your dress together, going down and signing autographs. Because then you come back up and it takes forever. So in the last years, I used to say, 
right, get changed and ready to go. I would bring up uh, autograph books that need to be signed for people who can't wait at all. You know, would rather, can you just sign this? I would get them up there. He would sit and sign, and sometimes it's books and old records and old things. He'd sign everything, and he wasn't just do that. You see, he'd, I'd say, or the stage manager would bring them up, you know, the stage doorkeeper would bring them up, put, get them to put their name on a bit of paper. Yeah. And, and it was quite a system then. So he would write to this. So he, he made a big thing of each. But that's the ones. And then quite a lot of those would still wait. Yeah. But some did have to go because they had to get back to school and then whatever in the morning. But at least if he was ready changed, then you're nearly ready to go. Yeah. So once people are finished and they're gone, we're ready to go. But if you do that and then have to go back and change it, it's so exhausting. Yeah. They said, you're killing yourself, you really can. Um, and but but people were understanding, but they did a lot did stay to wait behind because they wanted to actually see him and speak to him. Yeah. Uh, but it was no good saying, well, you've already had the thing signed, but they still want to have it speak. So that's fine. Yeah. And he didn't mind that at all. But but he said, well, save them waiting. I'll send sign them up here. So that became quite a useful thing to do. Um, so nobody missed out because some would wait and then have to go. Yeah. So I think yeah, that's the way to do it, Ken. And then you get changed as well. Should we do some quick fires? I'll kick it off. Go for it. Would you rather have pims on the lawn or mulled wine by the fire? Mulled wine by the fire. Would you rather in your garden have a jam butty mine or a gravy well? Oh, jam butty mine. <laughs> I got one. I didn't, didn't you realise? <laughs> Would you rather be a ventriloquist act or mistress of the ring? Ventriloquist. Well, you've already kind of been the mistress of the ring, haven't you, all these years? I did, I did want me to watch something of the ring in Aladdin once. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> would you rather listen to happiness or tears? Right now, if you had to choose one, which one would you listen to? Happiness. Good choice. Very good choice. Would you rather have a Sunday roast or a pan of scouse? Sunday roast. Both. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, would you rather be sat in the audience or waiting in the wings? Depends if it's on. You've got to make <laughs> a, a choice. Answer. That's a great answer, man. Actually, waiting in the wings is, is great. It's special, isn't it? It's pretty special. Well, Lady Anne, I mean, I was talking to my mum the other day. We were talking about how we were in the shows when we were young dancers. My mum was talking about when they used to come and watch Ken Dodd shows when we were in them. Yeah. And my grandparents used to come, great-grandparents... All these generations that Sir Ken inspired and touched and influenced and how you're carrying that legacy on in such a special way and I think you should be so incredibly proud of yourself and I think he would be so incredibly proud as well. You must be so pleased. I can, I, I've never looked at it like that. I really haven't. I've just found that perhaps I can't let go. It's only struck me. Perhaps I can't let go. Mm. Yeah, that's a lovely thought, though. Thank you for putting it in a, in a sentence. Yeah. Well, Sir Ken's legacy is in the best possible hands, I think. Thank you. Absolutely. Without a shadow of a doubt. And we're all so grateful for you for for, for carrying on. That's that's going. that's lovely. It's lovely to see young people so interested in theatre, in what's gone in the past, and what will happen hopefully in the future. And you are part of the future very much. And it's being positive and being the cup half full. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, thank it's you been so a privilege. Much. It's been a total it's privilege. Oh, it's been you. so lovely. <laughs> <Definitely. laughs> thank you so much. And you are our first lady. You are. We oh, really? Are very blessed. Oh, and I'm picturing you. your uh, parents watching you do your dame act behind the curtains <laughs> in your bedroom <laughs> and how. What, how they would feel knowing oh. all the things you're doing and that oh, you are lady you. and dog. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was gorgeous listening to that back and it's really made me so happy that we got to spend such a, a long time with such a special lady. I get a little bit misty-eyed listening to that really because like you say, we were given a and a lot of time, weren't we, with Lady Anne? But we went way over that time. She looked after us so well. She made us hot drinks. She brought us biscuits. She created such a lovely, cosy, warm atmosphere. And it just reiterated everything she said in the interview about family and community and joy and happiness. You couldn't have a better ambassador for this great man's legacy. Happiness. 
happiness the greatest gift that i possess oh gosh that was quite low for me there yeah i'll be singing tears after that (laughs) (laughs) now as we said at the beginning of this episode please tune in next week as we talk to showbiz producer michael harrison about all things pantomime one of our favorite subjects also along with this episode in a couple of weeks we'll be releasing the companion episode to this episode which includes an exclusive from michael harrison that won't be included in his full interview if you are a fan of sir ken dodd and if you would like to be included in the companion episode please leave us a message on our speak pipe www.speakpipe.com forward slash twice nightly the podcast let us know your personal memories of sir ken let us know your favorite sir ken dodd performance let us know your favorite sir ken dodd joke anything goes we want to show the love and spread the love for this icon of comedy or if you want to leave us a comment about sir ken on any of our social media posts we will happily read them out for you just search twice nightly the podcast on everything instagram facebook twitter slash x tiktok i couldn't think of the word tiktok then at all Showing your age. I know. Leave us a comment and we will make sure that they are all read out on that forthcoming episode. <laughs> <laughs> and if you would like to leave us a review or give us five stars, it really helps the podcast reach more people who love variety as much as us. And we're such a great big community that we want it to keep on growing. So all that's left for us to say is... See you next week. Actually, just cut that because that's boring. No, <laughs> no it's not. <laughs>